Good morning and welcome to Sunday School at Second Baptist Church. We're going to talk today about two stories um, from the Bible, and both of these are in the book of Luke, and they, they happened before uh, the crucifixion. And so, our, you know, we talked last week about the resurrection of Jesus, and now we're going back a little ways, and we're going to move forward again. So, in Luke chapter 18, right after we had studied the story of the uh, Pharisee and the publican praying and how the Pharisee prayed in contrast to how the publican prayed. So right after that, then, uh, comes the story of the rich young ruler who came and said, you know, what should I do um, to Jesus and to inherit eternal life and you know jesus said sell everything you have and give the money to the poor and basically the reason jesus was telling him that was because he could see that the man's money meant so much to him and so <clears throat> following that then there's a time one of the times where jesus pointedly says to his disciples that he's going to be crucified. And that is in Luke chapter 18, verse 31. And I'll just read that those two verses, a couple verses there. Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon, and after they have scourged him, they will kill him, and the third day he will rise again. <clears throat> I mean, that you can't make it any more clear than that, can you? I mean, he specifically uh, details all the things that are going to happen to him. And yet, the next verse says the, the disciples, you know, did not understand the meaning of this statement. So... In their minds, they still had that idea that he was going to be a king. He was going to rule, and they had not, you know, if you don't want to hear something, then you may not hear it, you know, because you, it's it's not the way that you've got it set in your mind that it's going to happen. So after that happened, then um, they, the, as they journeyed forward and as they were approaching Jericho, uh, now I'm going on down in verse 35 and I'm looking at that story, which is not in our book, but I wanted to cover it. <clears throat> um, there was a blind man who was sitting by the road begging. And when Jesus came near, this blind man starts to call out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the people who were with Jesus leading the way or whatever, you know, we're telling him, be quiet, be quiet, you know, stop shouting. And he wouldn't stop. He kept on crying out even more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped. And when he came near, he said, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. So, in our in our uh, lesson today, we're going to kind of talk about both of these stories. So I wanted to put that one in there because both of these people that we're talking about needed something from Jesus. They needed to have a touch from Jesus. And this blind man, he was very specific. You know, he, he cried out to Jesus. He would not stop crying out to Jesus, uh, saying, have mercy on me. In other words, um, don't give me what I deserve, um, but, you know, help me, help me. And Jesus said, um, you know, your faith, has made you well because he so strongly believed that Jesus was the one that could make him well. He knew no other way. He had no other choice of how he could stop being blind 
but he had faith that maybe Jesus, you know, could do it and could make him be able to see, and he did. And then from there, we go into our lesson for today, which is the story of Zacchaeus, which is a very famous um, one that we have known since our childhood. And um, so we're going to break that one down a little bit more. So I'm going to read the first four verses. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. Now, Zacchaeus was rich. He was not like the blind man. He, he didn't have the need for money, but he still had the need for Jesus. Um, and it says he was a chief tax collector. So he wasn't just a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector meaning that he supervised all the tax collectors and collected money from them. You know, it went on up the line, um, as those things sort of do. And so he was very wealthy. And who knows the things that he had done in his business practices to become as wealthy as he was. But he was very wealthy. And, and yet he was um, not very tall. And, you know, it. no matter how wealthy you are, you can't make yourself any taller, can you? And so he was not very tall. And he ran because he wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to see, you know, was he just curious about what he looked like? Or was he really wanting to follow Jesus? And he just had not had the courage to be in the crowd that had been going around following Jesus. At any rate, he runs and he goes up in this tree. And then let's read verses 5 and 6. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. Or my um, Bible also says rejoicing. So Zacchaeus was very happy that Jesus was coming to his house to um, eat with him or maybe even sleep there. And um, he hurriedly came down from the tree and gladly received uh, Jesus over to his house. And then what happened when, that, when um, Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house? In verse 7 it says, When they saw it, all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Now, it says in the lesson book, all who saw it began to complain. So we don't know who the all is. Obviously, the disciples, um, you know, would not have been included in the all, I don't think. You know, but the people who were following in the crowd who had been following Jesus... You know, and they, I, I get the idea of this boisterous crowd that's just following along now and waiting and to usher him into his kingdom as he begins to rule, you know. And then, you know, when he does this, when he goes to Zacchaeus' house, then they begin to grumble and complain because that's, he's not fitting the mold that they had for him. He, he's not doing things in the way that, they think he should uh, as their future ruler, you know, and their future king. Um, they, they may have had the expectation that he would look down on Zacchaeus because Zacchaeus was, you know, the, a tax collector. And the, that group of people was notorious. You know, everyone, I guess, looked down on them or, or maybe not looked down on them, but despised them because of the collecting of taxes. And so, um, you know, they begin to grumble. He's gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. 
So they already knew who was a sinner, I guess, and who was not. They were making a judgment, weren't they? And then uh, Zacchaeus said, uh, what? He, in verse 8, Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give it back four times as much. And so Zacchaeus makes this statement of his repentance. He's sorry for the things he's done in the past. And he's going to make amends by giving back. He's going to give half of everything he owns to the poor. And then anybody that he's defrauded, he's going to give that back four times over. You know, his encounter with Jesus, we don't know all the words that were said because obviously this was not all that was said. Um, he wouldn't have just gone into Zacchaeus' house, sat down, and then Zacchaeus made this statement. But um, Zacchaeus was ready to repent of the things that he had done in the past. And whatever was said and whatever transpired between him and Jesus, then Zacchaeus was a changed person. And he was going to do things differently. And I mean, to give half of all his possessions, obviously, he was making a commitment um, to be different than he had been up to now. And then Jesus responded in verses 9 and 10 by saying this, uh, and Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so, you know, Jesus makes a, a statement that hopefully the, the crowd and those who were grumbling about Zacchaeus being a sinner, hopefully they heard these words. He, too, is a son of Abraham. In other words, he is, even though he's not lived a life that you think he should have, and you've passed judgment on him, but yet he also is your Jewish brother in your Jewish family in the nation of Israel. He, too, is a son of Abraham. And then Jesus says, you know, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. So Jesus' um, focus was on those people who were lost. And he said that at other times when he said to the Pharisees, you know, if you, the he's not come to, um, let's see, how did he put it, the the one who's not sick doesn't need a doctor. You know, he said that one day. His focus was on the lost people, those who needed him, those who needed a touch from him, needed to know him. And really, that's all of us, isn't it? We all are in need of Jesus. Some people in the Bible and some people here in our world today they don't think they need Jesus. They think they're just great the way they are. And if you don't come to a point of knowing that you need Jesus, then you're not going to be able to find him, if that makes sense. Because you have to come as a little little child, like he said in another place. You, you have to humble yourself. The blind man humbled himself. And called out to Jesus. And that was, you know, an embarrassing situation for him. Can you imagine being blind? And maybe he was stumbling and trying to go in the direction that he felt was right. To be able to get close to Jesus. And all these other people were already close to Jesus. And they were telling him to get out of the way. Move back and be quiet. And yet he persisted in humiliating himself. Because he wanted that touch from Jesus and he wanted his sight to be restored. And Zacchaeus, you know, he humiliated himself, if he was a rich man, by climbing that tree and trying to see Jesus. And eagerly, 
uh, you know, receiving him into his house because, you know, sometimes when a person is wealthy, they're smug and they don't, they don't want to act like anything is, gets them excited or, you know, that they're too eager for anything. You've seen that before. And so Zacchaeus was not behaving in the way that maybe you might think for a rich person. And then he makes the, the bold statement, you know, about repaying people and, and giving half his possessions to the poor. And so he, he humbled himself before Jesus and salvation then came to Zacchaeus as well. And it's a lesson for us um, all as to how we must be humble and we must come to Jesus, you know, in that way if we want to be saved. I pray that you have made that decision at some point in your life, that you have humbled yourself, that you have come to Jesus as a child and ask Jesus to be your Savior. Because there's not another way um, to go to heaven and to be with Jesus unless you've done that. You can't be good enough. You can't say, well, I'm a good person. And I don't, I don't do things wrong to anybody. I live my life in a good way. I give to the poor. I, um, you know, do whatever. That's not enough. Because God is perfect, and heaven is a perfect place. And anything less than perfection cannot go to live in heaven and to be with God. And so the only way that we can have that chance to go and live with God is to be made perfect. And the only way that that can happen is through Jesus because by ourselves we can't possibly ever achieve it only through Jesus can we be made perfect can we be made clean enough and well enough to be able to um, at the end of our lives go and live with God so I pray you've made that decision and that that is a part of your life and your testimony that you can say to others and if you have made that decision, then it's important for us to also share that with others, isn't it? Because we come across people that are maybe would be disgusting to us in a way that are dirty or poor or, or blind or doing things that are disgusting. Um, they've taken on a lifestyle that is disgusting. Maybe they you know, have gotten into who knows what activity. Uh, but we come across these people sometimes. And yet we don't always bring them into the church with us, do we? And a lot of times they won't come. We have to, you know, we have to be willing to, just like Jesus did, reach and uh, grab that person by the hand and pull them up. And help them to know Jesus. Not just not help them to know us. Uh, that's not going to save them, is it? It's, I'm not able to save anyone. But help them to know Jesus. And by doing so, then um, their life can be changed. They can be a changed person just like these two people were. Thank you for being with me today. And um, I look forward to seeing you again next week.